Young and I'm with the Pueblo City County Library District and I want to thank you all for coming this evening to our seventh edition of Pachacta here in Pueblo. Uh, I'm working with Juan Morales at the um, CSU Pueblo and uh, in partnership with the university and the library we are putting on these events now here in Pueblo. This was started in 2003 by a a bunch of architects in Tokyo and they needed like a format to keep the architects from going on too far, too long so they came up with the standard 2020 format and which led to some interesting uh, presentations as you can see and so and it's it's not just about businesses it's not just about arts there's just a variety of things and so we're thrilled to have Pueblo as one of the 500 cities that's that does this globally our first presenter this evening is Sarah Crow. Okay, so what I'll be talking about is what people never tell you about before you move to Pueblo. So how many of you are from Pueblo? Okay, see, I love Pueblo. And every time I say that, people chuckle and like their eyes get really wide. I'm like, are you kidding me? You, really? But I, I really love it, and it might be because I'm not from here. Um, and so I, I moved to Pueblo two years ago uh, to start school, and this is... The kinds of things that people would tell me when I was saying, yeah, I'm moving to Pueblo. I'm like, really? You're, you're going to go to Pueblo? Because I was kind of in there and like, you're going to be the cool kid in Pueblo. Congratulations. Um, and that, that, you know, looking at this Lion King thing with the, you know, wherever the sun doesn't touch, that's Pueblo. You don't go there, Simba. Stay away from Pueblo. Um, and even looking at an Urban Dictionary entry of what Pueblo is, we're trying to see what it means to be in Pueblo. It is um, highlighted as the most bars per capita. Um, teen pregnancy rate, drug dealers, horrible, impoverished town. Um, you don't want to end up in Pueblo, dude. Um, man, this town is lamer than Pueblo. We just know that it's south of Colorado Springs, and it's also the town where dreams die. Um, but what people don't tell you about Pueblo, and the reasons why I love this town so much, um, number one is because it's affordable. Um, it was ranked number two in 2011 survey uh, for one of the most affordable places in the country to live. And I was looking at the median income as well as how much it costs to, to live in the houses, how much um, gas is, transportation. Um, so it's great things about the affordability. Um, the way that people talk in Pueblo is really entertaining, and I, I love it. Everything is plural. You don't go to Ross, you go to Ross's. You go to Walmart's or to Sonic's. Um, you just have to say, use guys, um, which, because that, that seems to be a Boston thing. And so you hear this like Boston accent, Mexican accent, Southern accents, but it's just really just Pueblo. But of course, we all know about the steel. And so that's one thing that you do know coming into Pueblo is that this is a steel city. There's a lot of pride in our steel here. Um, but what comes with that, though, that people don't often talk about is how, how hardworking and strong the people in this town are. People are dedicated. There's just this immense love and pride for building things. Um, and it's, it's a really unique thing. And the traffic is probably my favorite thing. I recently went to Denver, and I like, cringed the entire way because I was like, stop and go. I can get from one end of town in Pueblo to the other in like seven minutes. And if it takes me 11 minutes to go to work, then I get frustrated and I'm having a bad day. But to go like, you know, a mile up in Denver or in Springs, it takes an hour. The wildlife is by far my favorite thing living in Pueblo. Um, so the tarantulas especially, because I can handle snakes, but spiders make me want to cry. Um, Pueblo is part of the migration path for these tarantulas. And so um, late August into early October, they go right through Pueblo. And uh, I had a standoff with a tarantula on the campus at CSU Pueblo. And I was walking one way, and the campus was completely empty. And it's going the other, and we just like walked around each other. But the zoo was another great place of Pueblo. There's a zoo in the middle of a park. And I had no idea when I moved here that there was a zoo in the middle of a park. And so I um, was driving through the city park and saw the zoo and decided I need to go to there. And so I went. And there's eggs that you can jump into and, and play with different animals and see cool things. Um, every town has different urban legends, and so the tunnels underneath Pueblo is one that's still perplexing me. I'm still trying to find the tunnels where the mobsters would go or whatever. Um, but we did find some tunnels, and they were creepy, and a lot of stuff painted. And it was a very, very kind of shady thing to do, but it was highly entertaining. Um, so, gotta love the tunnels. The seasons, so we already know Colorado is ridiculous with its seasons anyway. So we have the, the five seasons of Colorado, including construction. But Pueblo has the, the sixth season, which is wind. Um, I can never wear like a skirt or something going on campus, especially because it's up on the hill. Just the way that the buildings are designed, it's like you go through a wind tunnel in and out of the buildings. 
Um, the festivals, oh my God, all the festivals in Pueblo, it's ridiculous. There's a festival for everything. We're always celebrating. There's the, the Chilean Frijole Festival, the B Street Bash, the Wild Wild West Fest. We have the State Fair. We have the, um, what was the, the boats, bands, and barbecues. A lot of alliterations is what we like to, to celebrate here. Um, so many festivals. Um, the sports is something that's equally ridiculous and awesome. Um, especially the football team, that rivalry between Centennial and Central High School. It's the longest standing one west of the Mississippi. I think it's like the 17th longest one in history of the U.S., um, these high school rivalries. And kickball apparently is very competitive, um, <laughs> despite the silly team names like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air that I play for. Um, so we also have our first Friday art walk, which is something that Colorado Springs has recently started doing more of. And so I'm like, go Pueblo, because we had this before them. Um, and I think it's just a great way to really showcase the talent because there's tons of talent, wonderful people, wonderful um, opportunities, different companies, different businesses. It's a great place to really showcase the culture. Um, the haunted wind chimes, they're really starting to gain a lot of popularity. They're going on tour and going to a lot of different places. Um, and they, they're from Pueblo. They're Pueblo grown and it's what they do. It's a great thing. Um, the burlesque thing. And here at the library, the All Pueblo Read series, which connects everybody in the, in the city to read the same book. And then we actually bring the author here, which is another fantastic opportunity. Um, so apparently these are kind of a big deal, green chilies. I've never ate green chilies until I moved here. I was resistant. I said, no, peppers, I don't do that. But now I can't stop. Um, I'm moving to Texas in August, and I already have a fund saved up to come back for the Chili Frijole Festival because I want to bring some chilies from Pueblo because it's a big deal. And of course, the sloppers. Um, oh my God, it's like a heart attack. Just like looking at it, I just feel like my arteries are clogging. Um, the sloppers were a really big deal too, and that's something that nobody else talks about. Even though it was showcased on the Food Network, we had that food wars between Sunset Inn and Coors Tavern. Um, Sunset Inn won, but I hear that's not a good thing. Coors is the best. Yes, I agree. Um, and also, it's a surprisingly progressive kind of city. So this is um, Pueblo County in October of 2012. They passed a city ordinance to extend uh, uh, benefits to the civil rights for city, employee, um, city employees and their partners to get health rights. And so uh, employers for the state of Colorado and for Boulder and Denver and now Pueblo have that rights going through. <laughs> and the characters of Pueblo. Billy Cox is actually a, a, an urban dictionary definition. Um, a legendary transvestite in Pueblo, Colorado, now used as a general term in Pueblo to refer to any male crossdresser. So, I mean, these are the great things. Anywhere you go, there's always these different characters, these different great people. And of course, it's things like this. This is the kind of thing that people don't always talk about, that when you come here, they don't really highlight, like, hey, we have these really great events, this pachaka cha thing, where people come around and hang out, people like you, come to these events to listen to people like me talk for six minutes and 40 seconds about things that we get excited about, and I get excited about Pueblo. So thank you all for being here in Pueblo, for listening to this, and for being part of this great town. I work in the outreach department here at the library, and one day I was looking through the books that were being discarded, and I found this really cool book called Word People. And it's about all people who um, have lent their names to our English language. Their, la their um, names have now become a, a word that we use in the English language. So this book outlines some criteria on how they decided that what they were going to use to to formulate the list here in this book and it says that the word must appear in American dictionaries the word must be uncapitalized so it can't be a proper noun any longer and uh, some other things so some of the <laughs> examples that we readily know from this are the words braille pasture and of course the teddy bear from Teddy Roosevelt those are some that we always think of on a regular basis, but this book sort of dives in just a little bit deeper. Two words like tawdry, which means gaudy and cheap and vulgarly ornamental. This uh, word was actually from Princess Audrey, and she was a wonderful, uh, beautiful princess that adorned herself with, beads of, with strings of beads. She also did not want to marry, so she uh, was still remained chaste after, I have to say this part, I'm sorry, after five years of marriage, she was still a virgin. Um, and <laughs> I know, I had to get that part out. So <laughs> um, 
boulderize is to expurgate per chauvinism is um, militant and boastful devotion. Now, this Nicolas Chauvin, he was a French soldier who fought for Napoleon, and he thought his compensation of $40 a month for his, uh, his, his injuries was so amazing that all he did was boast about how great Napoleon was. Boycott is um, to abstain from using, buying, or dealing with as a protest or means of coercion. And Captain Charles Boy Boycott is, uh, has lent his name to this word. He moved to uh, Ireland, and due to some of his practices, he was actually boycotted <laughs> in Ireland. The derby is uh, a term that's brought to us in, in horse racing nowadays, and the 12th Earl of Derby actually uh, this phrase is coined after him due to the lavish parties he had at an alehouse that he started to inhabit when he started regularly attending the horse races. Burke is to murder someone by suffocation as to leave the body intact so they can sell it for cadavers. And there were two guys, William Burke and William Hare, who ran a lodging house in Edinburgh that actually did this and sold the bodies to local doctors. Clarehue is a humorous quatrain about a person, and the one here that Edmund Clarehue Bentley, uh, they gave an example in the book, is this one about Sir Christopher Wren. The note that the first line of these quatrains often is the person's name. A pompadour is a hairstyle formed by sweeping the hair straight up from the forehead, and it is both a male and female hairstyle. The mistress to Louis the Fifteenth had finally, after her tawdry life in his, in theater, had uh, made this hairstyle fashionable. The saxophone is a wind instrument. That um, I'm not going to read that whole thing because I really want to tell you that the son of this instrument maker from Brussels had went to. Paris to establish a workshop, and he ended up getting the business of the French army, which actually is how the saxophone became a large and popular instrument in Europe. The bloomer, um, Amelia Jinx Bloomer, persuaded her husband uh, to omit the word obey from her vows. I thought that was pretty cool about her. But she actually wasn't really a woman's right advocate. She was very prominent in the temperance movement, though. Sideburns come to us from General Ambrose E. Sideburn Burnside. And this isn't him, but this is a man that won a contest that was after him in Alaska for a sideburn contest. It, he felt it, that it was his personal trademark. The cardigan, James Thomas Burnell, later the Earl of Cardigan, had as great aspirations for a military career. However, he wasn't very successful at it, but he did create beautiful uniforms. <laughs> and <laughs> they were adapted. <laughs> the word silhouette is um, a, a, a word that was brought to our, the English language from actually a French reformer. This French reformer, though, loved the people, and he actually cut down the salaries of many of the aristocracy and some of the cabinet members. But it turns out that the privileged people didn't like him for doing that, and they let him go. Um, mesmerize. Franz Anton Mesmer was a benefactor of Mozart that studied uh, different types of philosophy and science and galvanize. Luigi Galvini was an Italian professor that used frogs to study the, how currents flow through muscle tissue. And he coined the term animal electricity. Unfortunately, it turns out that he wasn't um, completely accurate in his findings, but he led to a lot of other interesting findings with galvanization. Gerrymander is uh, Eld Eldridge Jerry, who was opposed to British rule in the American Revolution. He actually had set up some, 
some cheating of the lines to, so that the Jeffersonians would actually win the election. And thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am so ready, Mr. Warren. Thank you. Everybody hear me all right? All right. This afternoon, this evening, I don't know what time it is. It's still light out. I'm going to talk to you about Chamberlains and Mellotrons, otherwise known as analog sampling keyboards, which have dated back to the 1940s, believe it or not, when a inventor in California had this wonderful idea to be able to accompany himself, Mr. Harry Chamberlain here, with uh, some rhythm tracks while he played his organ. So he recorded some drum loops and things and put them on tape and created the very first drum machine back in 1940, or was it 1948, 1949, called the Chamberlain Rhythmate. After coming up with that, he thought, well, why just have the sound of an organ? Why not have other sounds as well? So he went about recording all of these other instruments onto tape, violins, cellos, brass instruments, all kinds of string instruments, <clears throat> and created the Chamberlain. And played it for his friends, and they really liked it, and he thought, well, this might be something viable for me to sell to people who like to have parties where they have sing-alongs. So he happened to have a window washer work for him by the name of Bill Franson, who started an ad campaign and uh, was thinking about, well, we're using all these bits of tape and neat tape heads. I need to find some place where I can get them cheap. So Franson went over to England with two of these Chamberlains and found a place called, uh, it was, Pragmatic uh, Tape Company that uh, basically liked the idea and stole it from Harry Chamberlain and started their own subsidiary company called Melody Electronics or Mellotron for short and created this device here where the left the, the keyboard on the left hand side controlled all the little rhythm patterns and the keyboard on the right hand side had 18 different instruments in it. Now Harry didn't like that <laughs> at all so he sued the guys in England and got a nice $30,000 uh, settlement, thank you, which back in 1962 was a lot of money. And the stipulation was that they could, they could keep making them, but they had to call them Mellotrons and they could keep making them in the US. They were called Chamberlains. Now that big Mellotron with 18 different sounds in it was incredibly heavy. So they created the Mellotron Mark IV, which was a lot easier to transport because it could only play three sounds. And that became a standard instrument for a lot of progressive rock bands in the 60s and 70s. Uh, how it works is there was a little strand of tape that could play an eight second uh, note of music that when the key was pressed, it, it got pinched. Uh, if you look at number five over there on the right hand side, that was like the kind of a pinch roller that would pull the tape and then the thing on the right would spring it back into place when it was done, but you could only get eight seconds out of it, which was a little limiting, so as a keyboard player, you learned how to do th uh, different tricks in order to be able to get, get notes to play longer than, longer than they usually with octaves. Here's a, here's a look at it under the hood, uh, top down. You can see how, how the, uh, the tape strips run along there. Now, you weren't just locked into that set of three sounds that it came with. There were other banks of tapes that were available, but keep in mind, this thing weighed in excess of 200 pounds. This is the traveling version. Not that popular. A lot of people that started playing it, uh, gradually they started getting rid of them. You probably, if you're thinking, what the hell's a Mellotron? Well, the flute intro to Strawberry Fields Forever, that's a Mellotron. The flamenco guitar passage at the beginning of Bungalow Bill is a Mellotron. That's a single note with that on it. The Moody Blues used Mellotron in everything. All the string and brass sounds you heard. And it was handy because their keyboard player also happened to work at the Mellotron factory. More recent artists like uh, Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails has used a Mellotron, like uh, brought it back in the 90s on Closer. And the most recent recording with a Mellotron on it is Porcupine Tree's uh, Stephen Wilson with The Raven That Refused to Sing. He actually used one that dated back to the, to the 60s. So with all the problems they're having with the Mellotron, everybody liked the sound it made, so what could they do? Well, 
uh, one musician in particular, Rick Wakeman, who you might know from being in Yes, had this idea, well, why are we using a strip of tape? Let's use eight-track tape cartridges. So they made this thing called the Biratron, which went absolutely nowhere. Because at about the same time, somebody devised this device, the Computer Music Melodeon. This is the very first digital sampler that was ever created. And all of a sudden, you didn't have this huge box. You now had this little thing that could create the sounds. Mind you, if you know anything about sampling, 12-bit at 22K isn't so hot. In recent times, because people are in love with the sound, have decided to make their own. Uh, this is a Mellow Man, which is a Mellotron made out of Walkman cassette recorders. Each, each note played on the keyboard triggers one of the recorders and it sounds just like the real thing. It's, it's pretty amazing. The guys that were making Mellotron, guess what? They're still making them today. Uh, this is a Mark VI that they, that they made in 2005. They're, they're based, they, they moved from the operation from England to Sweden and they're still making them. They're, they're a lot lighter and, and they're a lot less uh, susceptible to temperature and humidity variation. But they went the full step forward in technology and created a digital one, which now captures all of the sounds instead of just getting three at a time. You've got the whole thing there in one concise keyboard and it's MIDI capable, so you can trigger it with, with all kinds of things. And as they were shrinking it down, why not shrink it down even further? Yes, there is an iPhone app called the Manatron, which will produce Surprise, the actual sounds. Like that's the choir, which you probably heard in various things. It's also MIDI capable, pretty amazing. That's a really super brief overview of this whole thing. If you're at all interested in finding out what really happened, I heartily recommend this documentary that came out a few years ago, Melodrama, the Melotron movie. Maybe maybe they can get it at the library, because that'd be great. <laughs> but thank you so much. And our next presenter this evening is Dave Ray. Thanks, Dave. So how do you pronounce this? I, I'm representing the Japanese portion of the show here. And... <laughs> My mom pronounces it completely different than I've heard a million different people pronounce it. But anyway, so I'll get on with it. I can't even say it's like pataka real fast. Like it's like oh, it's not karate, it's kate, you know. So ready to roll. I think. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little uh, 20 slide, 20 seconds on the secret to happiness. I'm gonna see if I can boil it down in six minutes. So this is actually an introduction to a Buddhist practice that I'm involved in, and we actually meet here at the library the first Sunday of every month. And so I thought how appropriate it would be to participate in this. So I thought I'd get this right out of the way because there's always a smart ass who says 42 because of the Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I don't know if you guys have read that book, but it has to do with a supercomputer that has supposed to answer the ultimate question. And the answer is 42 after millions of years. But then they forget what the real question was. And so they end up inventing Earth to figure out what the real question is, which is the meaning of life. And ultimately, um, I think the final part of the book is uh, God saying that, sorry for all the inconvenience, guys. But so, yeah, so this idea is that there is no secret to happiness, as we all know. And there's no meaning. You bring the meaning to it, right? So I'll, I'll break it back down to this idea of the different worlds that we live in. All of us actually live, we're, we're sharing the same space, but we all live in, how many people are there now? Six billion people? So we live in six billion different worlds, but they come down to um, this Buddhist uh, philosophy of, of, of ten worlds. And so I'll go through them one at a time here. So that's a Stedman. Um, this thing just broke on me. So the first world is hell, which is suffering. It's kind of the, the basic idea of you know, the depression where human beings can be. We've all been there. We've all probably know people that are, that are in that state right now. Might be why some of us are here, to avoid them. So the second one, hunger. That's the second world, desire. It's an art crumb, artwork. I tried to pick out some of my favorite things. And if I couldn't find them, I made my own. So, so this idea is we, we live in a consumerist society where we're constantly 
inundated with advertising on television from every direction telling us we need a desire. So we go to this third world. If we move past these first two worlds, it's a world of animals or animality. And so this is the idea of this instinctual fight or flight kind of process, the law of the jungle, with a kill or be killed sort of thing. These are actually, a friend of mine made these art. It's supposed to be me. We were putting a book together. I was processing all my, my stuff. So the fourth world would be anger. So anger is actually where the ego gets involved. And you, you, you're you looking at maybe this sort of kill or be killed mentality and you're moving beyond it. And it's where this world of competition really happens. So you have this idea of uh, trying to really gain power and money. We see it all the time. It's, it's a good thing to read. So it's one of my favorite writers. But the fifth world would be the world of humanity or tranquility, sort of this common state where you can easily be pulled into the first four worlds if you're not careful. Um, you know, so it's, it's basically an external thing. And then finally, the sixth world, the world of rapture, which is when you actually attain whatever you desire. So if you want to get that new BMW, you work your ass off and you get the BMW. Yay, yeah, you got a BMW. What's next? And you go back to the second world of desire, right? And so we live in a society where we're constantly rolling through these first six worlds over and over. So this was to remind me, okay, okay, yeah, the six worlds are the lower worlds. They're dependent on externals and not internals. So our whole happiness is constantly based on what I got for Christmas or who my wife is screwing around on me with and, you know, all this external kind of stuff. And you move to the seventh world, which is kind of the world we're, we're, we're sort of in right now, this world of learning, where you realize you're moving past this external thing and you're sort of, it's more a world of study. So this world of, of looking at other people and other ideas and trying to kind of understand how you sort of connect with that. It's another Stedman thing. Until you move into realization. This is the world where you figure out how to connect back. It's like going in the hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talks about. Going and uh, bringing back to your community, society, which is why I'm here. I'm trying to, trying to do that. My doctor says it's a good idea to go out and see people and, and talk to them. So I kind of realized that. So this is some kind of heavy reading here. So the only way I could do it is put it up there to try to explain it. You're probably familiar with the word or the concept of the bodhisattva. Sort of this idea of moving and, and sort of taking these things and really um, finding your happiness through helping others through suffering. So moving to the practice. So the tenth world is the world of Buddhahood or enlightenment. And it really, Buddha just means awakened. It means aware. So this idea of what, what I um, participate with and what I was kind of born into and, and, and still do is I, I part of this group um, that chants. It's chanting or verbal meditation, nam myoho renge kyo So this is some of my artwork. I'm just sort of giving you guys some crazy stuff to look at. But the word nam or namu means uh, to take refuge in, hail, devotion to. So as you're chanting, the chant would go like... Uh, Nam yo ho ringe go, nam yo ho ringe go, nam yo ho ringe go, nam yo ho ringe go. So you're basically chanting, myoho is mystic law. Nam meaning devotion to the mystic law, which, um, and, and I'll just go through the whole thing real quick. The mystic law of cause and effect, and you'll see another picture in a second. But really, this idea is we've got a lot of stuff going on in our lives. I mean, I know I do. And so sometimes I need to do a practice that that's like if you if you have dirt in water and it's muddy water you got to settle the water right and, and that's sort of the idea is this practice of this chant you know of uh, getting some place and it works you can go to the bathroom when you're in this chaotic situation and just sort of chant it's you, you guys familiar with the the ohm like the ohm it's all in the same key right and so this is that idea and this is just some more artwork but it's hard to break down the secret of happiness because there's really no secret, but I wanted to share. If you've ever seen the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It with Tina Turner, that's kind of her thing. And there's a lot of weirdos in the West Coast that practice this. But there's actually a group here in, um, in Pueblo, Colorado that actually come to this library and we meet and we do a little chanting, but we, you know, it's, it's really sort of an individual thing. And we just talk about our lives and I wanted to to let you guys know that, that it's open to the public and it's available here. I think Jesus was actually a Buddhist. <laughs> Buddha probably wouldn't be a very good Christian, though. Thank you, guys.
last but not least presenter of the evening and also some IT support for us <laughs> yeah. this, <laughs> this evening is Adam Pocus. Thanks, Adam. Sure. Check, check. All right. Um, So throughout my education, I became familiar with the old paradigms. I'd show up to class, doodle incessantly in my notebook, and fidget with boredom looking at text-filled slides on the, on the screen. So I was interested in the content. I just really wasn't engaged. So by the time I went to college, I was pretty accustomed to these ways of learning. So it was easy for me to get distracted or bored, especially at home. So I counteract a lot of this stuff by making my own objectives and mini challenges to complete the work and be a little bit more productive. So for example, I'd set a goal to finish an assignment in an hour or less, and if I can complete that assignment in an hour or less without any distraction, I'd reward myself with some internet browsing or maybe uh, take a uh, look at some video games. So the rules and objectives I was uh, setting for myself gave me this additional motivation, and these self-imposed barriers made it actually pretty fun. So I was excited to complete the work and was really proud of my accomplishments. I was earning rewards and way more engaged in my study, and yes, I still do this today. So there was a brief period of time I questioned my ability to pay attention. I was concerned, I went to the doctor, but in the end, I didn't have any attention deficit. I could sit for hours designing, focus on conversations, and even play video games without any issue. So what was going on? Well, gamification marketer Gabe Zitcherman thinks that young learners today can't not pay attention because uh, school just moves too slow. And if I was distracted over a decade ago, I was wondering what's happening today. So youth are multitasking. They're using smart devices, social networks, they're texting, they're blogging, produ producing videos. And youth are playing extremely complex games. And of course, juggling interruptions from their parents. So 67% of US households play games. So there's about 183 million gamers in the US and that number's still rising. So 40% of that population are women. I know it says 40 up there, but new things of it is 47. And the Pew Research Center survey finds that almost all youth, 12 to 17, they're playing games in some form or another. So the current generation is used to gaming. And if not willing, they're expecting to utilize game strategy and mechanics in education, the workplace, and life. Those are my kids, by the way. Youth are engaged in activities that feature game mechanics such as social networks, forums, fitness, restaurants, and many more. Education is lagging behind. So that begs the question, what is gamification? Well, it's the use of game thinking and mechanics in a non-game context to engage users and solve problems. So I refine that definition to say that it's the use of game thinking and mechanics to facilitate social engagement, active learning, and critical thinking. So in games, players are shown or discover the main objective through some sort of narrative or theme. The players are exposed to achievements or quests to complete objectives, and they'll earn awards along the way. So players might solve a puzzle and receive a digital badge or gain experience points for incremental tasks. And this comes with screens that they can assess their current skills. So what games do is they create these engagement loops. The basic loop consists of challenge, achieve, and then reward. And it's a cyclic process, it's going to repeat. So neuroscience has found that video games can create these, serio, uh, these scenarios with dopamine released in the brain. So what dopamine is, it's a chemical that will help control the pleasure and reward center of the brain. Now, dopamine is naturally produced and is typically based on intrinsic rewards or needs. So video games can, uh, achievements can trigger and release this neurotransmitter. The takeaway here is that video games can do this at high frequency and they can produce happy and engaged players. So the better the game, the better the results. Author and game designer Jane McGonigal wrote in her book, Realities of Broken, about the power of games. She discusses her research and the positive impact that it can have on our lives. And games can change the future. So distilled down, she comes up with four basic traits that are in any game. Goals, rules, feedback system, and voluntary participation. So reviewing the traits of games, you can draw parallels to education. The goal may be to succeed, the rules to complete the work well and on time, and feedback are the grades and the comments, and voluntary participation, well, hopefully everyone's there to learn. So education is the traits of the games, but it needs help. Game thinking and mechanics can help drive better engagement. 
Now, the big concern with gamification and learning, or in general for that matter, is the motivations. Intrinsic versus extrinsic, or the idea of something natural as opposed to something non-essential. So, will building these systems that give extrinsic rewards shift the focus away from the things that have intrinsic value? Well, gamification is not here to replace curriculums or teachers. It aids in the engagement strategy, and it increases the motivation, but it could only go so far. We still need great teachers, teachers who can encourage, build relationships, and facilitate dynamic communication. Gamification is merely a tool. So the gaming rubric is different than in education. It can provide almost instantaneous feedback. In a typical school, learners start at 100% and they lose percentage points throughout the course. And they might not even know the grade until the end. So grades shouldn't necessarily go away, we just need to find a better way to deliver that, just-in-time feedback, and badge learners for doing things that are good outside of grades. So we can start by incentivizing the content with intrinsic value and help increase that motivation. The completion of quests and achievements will help the assessment in both directions. And students can see in real time where they are at and where they need to improve. And then the teachers can track and also assist those students just in time or at least close to real time. So going forward, we have to discover the balance between gaming and learning strategy. There will be pitfalls and things that don't translate, but Failure is an excellent learning lesson as well. Gamification is already in practice from the curriculum level at some schools, while other creative teachers are experimenting with in the classroom. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to embrace the growing population of young gamers and learners. This generation is living in a different paradigm than the century before us, and a lot of that has to be due to the exponential growth of technology right over the last decade. We need to be focused on creating more motivated and engaged future for today's learners. I'm Adam Poshis, and I have a passion for technology, design, and learning. I've been working at the Instructional Technology in Colorado State University Pueblo over the last five years, and I'm dedicated to designing a better future in today's learning for the youth with the assistance of technology and game thinking. Thank you, and have a good night. If you know anybody, if you yourself would like to present, don't forget we do have a little survey there. Or if you would just like to help us out on an evening and come and be a volunteer, we'd love to have you for that as well.